Let's say hello to Big Bo, Tony Baselli. He joins us now, a future Hall of Famer. Does that feel good, Tony? I mean, are you already maybe, I, sh- I shouldn't even say it, getting a little tired of hearing that? No way. No, I'm not getting tired of hearing it. <laughs> and actually, technically, it's not future because I've been, I've been right, uh, that's enshrinement, future enshrined, but uh, actually in it. So the, I don't have to hear the future part anymore, uh, Josie. Oh, I like that that's part, a, too. I do like that. Listen, a, that, we're all nice, pumped up. Yep. So, Big Bo, how, how has your life changed uh, since, you, you know, you've been going getting inducted to the Hall of Fame? I mean, media, time, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely more, uh, especially early. The media onslaught was quite a bit. And uh, a lot of, uh, you know, it almost reminds me a little bit back to the early days, Leon, when everyone in town wanted to say hi or talk to you or, say something about the Jaguars because everyone was so excited and they'd see any of us out in public and, you know, a lot of well wishers and all that good stuff. It's almost, it's, it, you know, after making it the Hall of Fame, I mean, people in Jacksonville are so excited and they're so kind and, and everyone wants to come say something and say, you know, whether you're out in the grocery store or eating dinner or just walking around. So I think that's been, a, uh, that's ramped up to a whole nother level. And then just all the appearances. So, and so, uh, and they and they pay you more now, Leon, when you have HOF at the end. That's a, well, that's that's a good another, thing. That, that's a good thing. Yeah, it's absolutely. Just, it's so, it's so. all good stuff. And uh, but I think the biggest change for me, it's it's just such a, you know, anyone who's played the game, none of us played the game to be in the Hall of Fame, but the recognition and the honor to be in the Hall of Fame, it's just, it's uh, you almost, I, I have to catch myself and remind myself, almost pinch myself. Um, that it's happened, and uh, it's just a, been a really cool experience. So, where are they putting the statue? Uh, right the stadium. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I haven't heard about a statue. Uh, I, you know, we'll see. I, I've never uh, heard anyone saying that. I'm sure some of them are questioning uh, putting a statue out there. If, if they ever end up doing that, that people would have to look at my uh, my mug every time they walked into the stadium. <laughs> It's not every day you get to talk to the two best offensive tackles in Jaguar history. We got Leon Searcy in studio with us and Tony Baselli, the Hall of Famer, on the phone line on XL Primetime. Tony, we haven't talked to you since the Jaguars spent $250 plus million in free agency, bringing in seven guys initially, adding a couple more as of late, including Arden Key yesterday. Uh, your thoughts on the Jaguar free agent hall, man? How much better did the team get? Well, I mean, one thing you can't, you know, don't ever question Sean Conn and his willingness to invest and try to try to bring a winger win, winner here. I mean, he's done it. Obviously, everyone knows about trying to improve the facilities and got a practice facility coming. And I think you know, hopefully, in the near future, we'll get a renovated stadium and all that kind of good stuff. So he's investing and now he's investing in players, um, and they were super aggressive. And I think one thing, and I've heard you guys talk about it a little bit. I think you got to always remember. You're always going to overpay for guys in free agency. That's just the nature of the beast um, because you're it's a competitive market, and you got to. And if you really want a guy, you got to go write the check to get him to come. And and they they're making some big bets. I mean, you look at a guy like Christian Kirk. I mean, they're paying him as the number one receiver. He's never been anything but a three. Um, and so they're seeing something in him and projecting that he can become that go-to guy. It reminds me a little bit, and Leon will remember this, you know, the year Leon came from the Steelers, and, you know, he was already an established. He was the guy, one of the best right tackles in football. So that was and that was a much of a risk. But then I think about Keenan McCardell, and that, that he was the big free agent signing at receiver we got that year. And he was, you know, he wasn't a premier wide receiver at that time when he came over. You know, he's a late draft pick with the, uh, with the Washington command, Commanders and and was probably a two or a three kind of a, a you know a guy on the roster and we paid him and he came in and Tom Coughlin made the bet that he could become the go-to guy and Keenan became a Pro Bowl receiver that's who he was he just needed the opportunity to do it and that's what you're betting with Christian Kirk you're betting that he has the skill set the talent the ability to be that number one guy who's going to get the best corner and the coverage is going to go to him and everything else. And you paid him like that. And now 
we'll just have to wait and see, and let's hope they're right, that he can become that guy. So they made some bets like that. I really like the, the bet they made with Evan Ingram. That's mm-hmm. a you know low risk, a lot of upside. If he becomes the guy that, that he was drafted in the first round, that receiving threat at tight end, um, that's a, I love that move. I love the bet. I love Sh- uh, Shreve is, is one of the best guards in football. Question on him is, can he just stay healthy? And when he's healthy, um, he's as good as guard that you're going to get. He's really dang good. And you paid him like that. And so they took some calculated risk. They spent a bunch of money, um, overpaid probably for a couple guys. That they, you know, maybe they could have got him for a little bit less, but they had to improve the roster and they had to get guys who were dynamic on the offensive side of the ball and who could score. We have, we have, we have, scru- we have struggled to score points for a long time here. And in today's NFL, if you can't score, you're not going to play good enough defense to win. And so they got, they had to go get playmakers and, and hopefully the likes of Evan Ingram and Christian Kirk and, you know, they got Zay Jones. Um, hopefully those guys are going to upgrade uh, the offense quite a bit. And I still think there's a lot of questions at the running back position. You know, what are you going to do there? You don't really have too many healthy guys in that room right now. And so I think there's some question marks in that area. Tony, it's a perfect segue for my next question. We were arguing about moving back into the first round. Um, did the Rams and a couple other teams, did they show everyone that you've got to start rethinking about first-round picks, and it's not just the typical what the NFL thinks the value is, but it's the value to the team? Well, like, would you trade back in the first round if you if you thought there was someone there that could immediately help your team? Yeah, if you think you're going to go get an immediate starter, who can come impact your your roster, then yeah, I have no problem with that. Um, but you got to be right. And we have not been right very often in the draft lately. Right. And, and so until we start making bets that pay off, um, you're going to struggle because I think it's hard. And it, especially to make it sustainable to continue to build through free agency. Um, now everyone will point to the Rams that, They've traded, you know, every draft pick known to mankind, um, and they won a Super Bowl. Um, but they also, they, I think, the, their ability to do that is they obviously hit on some big guys like Aaron Donald and such. But they've also kind of found those second, third, fourth, fifth rounders, of, you know, to fill out their roster um, that they can build around the impact players that they acquired. So, you know, a guy like Cooper Cup, and you know you know, obviously draft pick and develop and you go down the list. So it's always a combination, but I really think you have to build that foundation through the draft. And we just haven't been very good at drafting that. Talk with Tony Baselli, member of the Hall of Fame class 2022. I think that's the perfect way to say it. Right now, he will be signing like a Hall of Famer at Palm Beach Autographs Saturday night at 6 o'clock. That's in the Avenues Mall. We're going to give listeners a chance to win a, a ticket to go get an autograph from Big Bo. And, and Tony, jump in just a couple more minutes with you. Jump in on Tyler Shatley. Before we even talk about you know the idea of maybe drafting an Evan Neal, whatever, do you think he's going to be able to hold down that spot now that Brandon Linder has uh, announced his retirement, and that's a good solution to that position? Yeah, the only thing I'll say, I think, we're, isn't it the signing Friday night, Josie? Mm-hmm. Um, we it says Saturday, April second. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I probably got my dates wrong then. And you know uh, what? <laughs> yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that we have you on to make sure Saturday, April second, and I will text Buckley while we are talking. How about that? Perfect. Um, I like that. Uh, Yeah, I think, you know, one, let's start with Brandon Linder. Mm -hmm. Um, That was one of the draft picks that they called the Wolves did hit on. You know, for a third-round pick, I mean, he became a bona fide, strong starter, borderline Pro Bowl type of player, um, was a great pick. And he was a great Jaguar and had an outstanding career. Unfortunately, just as years went on, you know, you know, Brandon just, you know, couldn't stay on the field. I think the, the the nagging, lingering injuries, you know, built up, and he made the decision. It was time, for, you know. I think every guy at some point, you know, some of it's forced. It was forced on me, where body just didn't work anymore, couldn't play. Other guys just are done mentally and physically of going through the grind. And obviously, Brandon Linder got to that point. And it was time to move on. So kudos to him. He had a really good career. Um, he was a good, you know, great guy, good for the community, and he was a good football player. So. He will be missed. He will be missed. Um, as far as Shatley, 
I think what Shatley has proven, and I got a lot of respect for him because he's gotten better every year. And I thought last year when Linder got hurt, I didn't, I didn't think there was a noticeable fall off when T- Tyler Shatley came into the game. And I thought he played good football. Like, like you watch the tape and you watch him, you're like, hey, this is guy, he can play. And he is a good center. Um, is he an upper echelon center at this point? No, but maybe with the reps and, and have the ability to be that guy and go in um, based on his history, how he's gotten better every year. Um, he might very well could be the solution. But I do think it also kind of makes you, forces you a little bit in this draft to go look for an interior lineman that can play center or maybe center guard um, and that you can develop. So I'm talking, you know, that third, fourth round pick mm-hmm. of going and get an interior offensive lineman. I think that's going to be critical now with the, the exit of Brandon Linder. That's a good segue, Big Bo, because I was going to ask you, if you, if someone told you that week one, you got Robertson, you got Barch, you got Shatley, you got Sheriff, and you got uh, Juwan Taylor. And Shatley gets hurt. How, how do you feel about that? I said there's absolutely no depth on the offensive line if anybody gets hurt. Yeah, I think I think I mean you have depth to tackle because I, I I think Walker Little I I actually think Walker Little can maybe push Juwan Taylor at that right tackle position. You know, you've heard Trent talk about maybe he can move maybe. Even push, you know, look at Walker Little at the guard position, left guard, push Barch. I mean, who knows? I think he's what he showed you the last three games. You know, he's a big physical guy and really, you know, struggled in preseason, but when he got the chance to start left tackle, did a good job those last three games. So that's a positive. I agree with you. The depth is a concern. You know, I think, you know, Casey McDermott is a guy who was the backup center after Linder got hurt. Are you confident he can be an everyday a starter? I think probably not at this point of his career. Um, and so um, that's why I think you've got to address that, Leon. You're going to have to go out in the draft and and maybe maybe if there's a at that second round pick, there's a you know one of the top centers slides into the beginning of the first round, uh, beginning of the second round, maybe you make that pick there. But I think definitely interior offensive line is something you got to look at at the middle of the draft. Hey, Tony, as we begin to wrap up, again, Tony Baselli here with us on XL Primetime. Two-part question, real quick. Number one, if Jawan Taylor loses the right tackle battle to Walker Little, could Jawan Taylor play left guard? And number two, do you believe it's Aiden Hutchinson a month from today? Um, so, on Jawan, I, I don't know if Jawan Taylor can play guard. I really don't. Um you know, as Leon will tell you, I mean, it's, you know, playing offensive guard, there's some benefits because you got protection on both sides and you can kind of bounce guys around. It's, you know, less of a space player, but guys get on top of you right away. And, and so can, you know, you would hope Juwan Taylor could do that. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, so I think that's a great question. I mean, it'd be interesting to see how that battle goes and where, you know, where, where does, where do they put the guy who ends up losing the battle? Does he just become the swing tackle or there, is there a spot at that, that left guard position that he battles with uh, Ben Barks? I think there'll be a lot of cross training in, in training camp this year with the offensive line. As far as the, the pick, um, I'm not sure. I mean, Aiden Hudson, you know, obviously really good college player. You know, he's going to come in. He's one of those guys who's going to have be refined it's going to be refined and uh, and with his skill set, and he uses his hands really well. I still think, Hacker, I, I would go pick the best player. If Evan Neal is the best player in this draft, I would pick him mm-hmm. because I go back. I, I, this team needs more top five players at their position. If I were to ask you guys how many top five players at any position on the football field do the Jaguars have at this point? Yeah. Trevor, and he hasn't proven that yet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and that's how you win in this league. You win with great players. And then you, around those great players, you put good starting caliber football players. But you have to have difference makers. When we were good and consistently good in the 90s, we had difference makers. We had Jimmy Smith, we had Fred Taylor, we had Keenan McCardo, we had Leon at the right tackle, one of the best right tackles in all of football consistently top five at his position. 
You had guys on the defensive side that were difference makers. Tony Bracken, you know, granted he probably underperformed to, to, to his talent level because I think Leon would tell you he's one of the most talented guys I've ever been around. But when he wanted to turn it up, he could disrupt the entire game. And so you have to get more of those type of players. Um, and so I go back if it, and I'm not saying I haven't watched enough tape. This is where you know this is what why what Trent gets paid to do and that staff gets paid to do and Doug Peterson. They got to go do the evaluation and say, we need to just get more good football players. And if it's Evan Neal, you go, well, gosh, now we have you know too many tackles. Well, I'll go back to the 96 draft when the Baltimore Ravens picked Jonathan Ogden number two, and he played left guard. and ended up being one of the best left tackles ever. And they had a Pro Bowl left tackle when they drafted him in Tony Jones. Um, and so I just don't think he can get enough good players. And so if it's Aiden Hudson, pick him. If it's Evan Neal, pick him. I don't care who it is. Just get – we need good football players on this team. Yeah, and those are two crucial spots, that's for sure. All right, so I did confirm with Martin Buckley. It is Saturday night, 6 o'clock at the See, Avenues. I, so You helped me because I, I had the wrong date on my calendar. I'm glad. All right. I'm, I'm, Tony would have shown up there yesterday yeah. and be like, have they yeah. forgotten about me already? What's going on here? I'm, uh, I'm shooting you the little flyer on it, okay? So, so you'll have it, all right? I love it. All right. Well, Perfect. listen. Listen, we are all fired up because I think uh, by you getting voted into Canton, the entire station is coming to Canton. So we are looking forward to that and enjoy all the run-up to it and uh, obviously the when it all goes down. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.